Lately, there's been a lot of talk online about this thing called Kratom or Kratom. 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 It's touted as a so-called natural painkiller or sometimes as an herbal supplement that some people claim could ultimately replace opioids. They serve drinks made with kava and kratom. Anywhere from 9 to 10, maybe sometimes 11 or 12. Nebraska made it illegal for anyone under 21. And in this video, I'll be looking into what kratom is and what's actually going on pharmacologically when someone takes it. I want to find out if it actually works, if it's safe to use, and if it really deserves the hype or the concern that surrounds it. Why has this plant been both fascinating and worrying researchers around the world for the past couple of decades? Let's get into it. There's growing concern about the safety of a popular supplement known as Kratom. Some say it's as addictive as heroin. Others say it's the cure to their chronic pain. There's the Kratom leaf, which has trace amounts of 7-OH. I'm Dr. Daniel Medell, an anesthesiologist. Kratom is the common name for Mitragena speciosa, a tropical evergreen tree in the same family as coffee. It grows in Southeast Asia, mainly in countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. For centuries, local communities there have used kratom leaves for energy and pain relief. Farmers would chew the fresh leaves while working in the field to fight fatigue and increase endurance. Depending on how much they consumed, they'd feel either a mild stimulant effect or a calming analgesic effect. Today, kratom is commonly sold as a dried powder or in capsules. Some people brew it as tea and others mix the powder with juice or coffee to mask its very bitter taste. In the US and many other countries, it's marketed as a dietary supplement, even though it's not approved for any medical use. Now let's talk chemistry. Chemistry. The active compounds in Kratom are its alkaloids. Over 40 have been identified so far, but the two big ones are mitragynine and 7 hydroxymitragynine Mitragynine makes up the majority of the alkaloid content in the leaves, somewhere around 60 to 70 percent, but 7 hydroxymitragynine even though it's present in tiny amounts, is actually the one that packs the big punch. In terms of potency, animal studies have shown that 7 hydroxymitragynine can be up to 13 times more potent than morphine when it comes to pain relief. That's an enormous number especially when you consider that it's a naturally occurring compound in a leaf that's still legal to buy in many places. But before anyone starts thinking this is a natural morphine, let's look at how it works and how it differs from traditional opioids. Both mitragynine and 7 hydroxymitragynine act on the body's opioid receptors, mainly the mu, delta, and kappa receptors. These are the same receptor systems that drugs like morphine, oxycodone, and fentanyl target, but there's a key difference with kratom, because its alkaloids are what we call partial agonists at the mu opioid receptor. That means they activate the receptor, but not to the full extent that a traditional opioid does. So the effect is similar, but it's somewhat blunted. What these compounds actually do is really interesting. They preferentially activate one signaling pathway, the G protein pathway, while avoiding another pathway, the one that's linked to side effects like respiratory depression. This selective activation might explain why users often report pain relief and mild euphoria without the same level of respiratory depression that we fear with stronger opioids. But, and there's always a big but in your way, we don't have enough data yet to confirm that it's actually any safer. The animal data are promising, but we can't assume it translates perfectly to humans. Another interesting detail is that mitragynine, the main alkaloid, is actually converted into 7-hydroxymitragynine in the liver. So in a way, 7-hydroxymitragynine is the active metabolite, similar to how codeine is metabolized into morphine. This means that differences in liver enzyme activity between individuals, or taking drugs or medicines that interact with these enzymes, can drastically change how strong or how long-lasting Kratom's effects will be. That's one of the main reasons why Kratom can feel so unpredictable. Two people can take the same dose and have completely different experiences depending on their metabolism, liver function, and what medications they might be taking. One of the most confusing things about Kratom is that its effects change depending on the dose. At lower doses, it tends to act more like a stimulant. Users often describe feeling more alert, energetic, and talkative, kind of like drinking a cup or two of strong coffee. At moderate doses, the effects shift toward pain relief and mild sedation. At that point, people may feel calmer, more relaxed, and a little bit less anxious. Once you get into high doses, though, Kratom starts to feel much more sedating, and side effects become more noticeable. The main ones are things like nausea, dizziness, or confusion. So it's this really dose-dependent duality that makes Kratom so interesting pharmacologically. Now, we have to talk about the other side of the story here. Kratom's not some kind of new risk-free miracle drug. While it's often marketed as a safe, natural alternative to opioids, the FDA and the DEA have both expressed serious concerns about its safety profile. There have been reports of dependence, withdrawal symptoms similar to opioids, and in some cases, seizures and liver toxicity. Some users who stop after chronic use experience irritability, muscle aches, insomnia, and some pretty severe cravings. Its legal status varies widely around the world. 
In the United States, Kratom isn't a controlled substance at the federal level, but several states and cities have banned it. Thailand actually banned Kratom for decades, but re-legalized it in 2021 for medicinal and personal use. In contrast, it remains illegal in countries like Malaysia and Australia. So you can see why there's this huge debate. Some view it as a valuable harm reduction tool for people trying to avoid opioids, while others see it as an unregulated street drug with serious abuse potential. So where does that leave us? Well, Kratom is a plant with complex pharmacology. Its main alkaloid, mitragynine, and its more potent cousin, 7-hydroxymitragynine, do have genuine analgesic and opioid-like effects. In theory, they might offer pain relief and less respiratory depression, but the data are far from conclusive. At this stage, we can't really call it safe or effective for medicinal use, and the lack of standardization in commercial Kratom products adds another layer of risk. Potency varies drastically from one batch to another, and some products have been found adulterated with other substances. So if someone tells you that Kratom is a harmless herbal supplement, that's a gross oversimplification. It's a pharmacologically active plant that needs much more research before we can say whether or not it's truly harmless or what its side effects might be. So is Kratom nature's opioid? Well, in a way, but that doesn't mean it's a safe or predictable one. What Kratom really highlights is how thin the line can be between medicine and poison especially when we're talking about substances that interact with the body's opioid system. If you or someone you know has had any experience with Kratom, good or bad, let me know in the comments. Thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.